Hello everyone and my name is Terana Wurigo. We're gathered today on Gadigal land. I pay respects to elders who have cared for country and waters since time immemorial. Uh, and respects also to other First Nations peoples in this room. Um, and actually I follow the protocol of my father-in-law who is a South Sea Islander, Torres Strait Islander and um, um, and a uh, uh, Bajalang man to pay respects to all of your elders, no matter where you come from, and um, the stories that we carry with ourselves today. So, I wasn't born here in Australia, but I have made it my home. When I came here, I want to tell you, I found the land very strange. <laughs> so, the land looks it looks strange to me, right? Very different to my homeland where I'm, I'm filled with, you know, deep forest greens. The water was fluorite blue and everything is swollen with a kind of constant dampness. And this strangeness that I felt when I came here, it extended also to the absence, that missing of everyday encounter, everyday connection with Australia's first peoples. Um, and, and in New Zealand, right, it's, it's a very, very different experience. Everyday encounter or everyday connection with Māori people is completely normal. So, so when in 2017 I heard the invitation from Australia's First Peoples to join them in a movement um, uh, with all Australians and a movement for a better future, I heard this invitation of connection, something that I cleave to, something which I draw my cultural authority from to join our first peoples in this walk together for a better future. I heard that invitation of connection. Of course I'm an Aussie now citizen so I can vote, which is relevant if I'm speaking here. But I want to say that invitation of connection, I heard it offered to me personally. And so the challenge for you, but I'm, I'm gathering that maybe it's a challenge we've all chosen to accept is whether we hear that invitation of connection for ourselves. So who am I? I'm a sovereign woman of the Two Whareto and Te Arawa Nations of Aotearoa, New Zealand. That's on my mother's side. And on my father's side, I am Chinese Māori. But I've also had the great privilege and opportunity to join in um, through marriage uh, with the clan of the Wadagos. And so this is a, this is a big clan. Uh, they've got South Sea Islander heritage and that stretch all the way up, uh, up the east coast of Australia. And then in my particular family, this is my husband here, Colin. Um, in my particular family, also got connections to the Bundjalung Nation of the uh, Northern Rivers, New South Wales, and then with the Torres Strait Islands. Um, as Peter mentioned, Jeff Scott, unable to be with, here, uh, be with us here today, he does send his apologies. Um, do you know it was his desire and his idea to be here? He wanted to be here. He asked, let's set it up, we want to do a politics in the pub because he just really wanted to acknowledge the good, good work that um, this group has been doing for, for many decades, for 34 years. Um, he sends his apologies. He has been, he's been held back in Melbourne because, um, as we've heard, today is the launch of um, Uluru, he works with Uluru Dialogue, he's one of the ringleaders, the executive director, um, and he is down there in Melbourne when they do the national launch of their TV ad campaign using Johnny Farnham's song the voice but my story i want to share with you i do want to share with you my experience of everyday connection with maori people and i think it's relevant because as i mentioned when i came here it just seemed to be absent that opportunity to connect albeit that was 20 years ago but it seemed incredibly strange to me to not encounter on a daily basis not to experience what life looks like with um, australia's first peoples and of course, I do think that with this referendum, that is our opportunity to connect with Australia's people, First Peoples. In this moment, at this time, in this referendum, we will be asked whether do we choose to accept, do we hear that invitation to connect and will we accept it and say yes? You all have amazing hearing. Oh, my <laughs> <laughs> I like 
awkward thing, really. Okay, so I'm not sure if you're aware, but the statement from the heart describes a basic injustice facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, yeah? It's incredibly tragic, but an Aboriginal baby faces a future today with outsized chances of being taken from his nuclear family, going to juvenile detention, going to prison, suiciding, having chronic health problems, dying earlier than a non-Aboriginal baby. How is this even right? Morally and practically, the statement from the heart says that our First Peoples cannot change these chances without us. Sure, there's some complex and definitely some arguments out there to say our First Peoples don't need us, sure. But this referendum is about how we show solidarity along with our First Peoples to come alongside and accept that invitation. I'm choosing to deal with this injustice by saying yes in the referendum. Because as I see it, uh, protesting the referendum or writing no is just to accept this injustice and to perpetuate it. It's to accept no change. And so I believe that if we are interested in justice for all, that we must be interested for justice for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So I got asked yesterday um, to go further in painting uh, for my listeners this picture of connection uh, with Māori people. And to be honest, I got really stumped because I was like... <coughs> I, I struggled to find the words and the descriptors to give adequacy to the threads that weave non maori lives with Māori lives. So I'm going to try and paint this picture here, and I, I, I hope that it offers some insights into the opportunities, or perhaps the dilemma, depending on how where you're at with uh, your decision to vote. So, I mentioned before the threads that weave non maori lives with Māori lives. So, for example, the thread of Māori lives. There are threads upon which stories of Māori people imbued with their cultural narratives, with my cultural narratives, with our cultural narratives, that carry with them distinctive stories of our people's time and place and histories. Then there are threads which have arrived from foreign shores. First, with the British and then decades later with migrant peoples, bringing their own cultural narratives and their own personal stories of how they came to be living among Māori people. But over time, what we have seen in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is that some of those threads became intertwined and interwoven. They became woven together, so that different threads joined together at different points in time, creating something new, something different, distinct threads, representing the stories of those peoples that came together and that joined together at that moment in time. They are still part of the integral fabric of New Zealand society and who we are as New Zealanders. And I say all this because when I got asked that yesterday, I just obviously couldn't think about it. And I did find it challenging to essentialise what my what connection for Māori looked like. And I realised there is no one characteristic, but rather there are many. I'm going to share some of you with uh, some of them with you. Māori is a national language in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So that means, uh, so we are a bilingual nation, both English and Māori are our national languages. So it doesn't matter where you come from, you might be Filipino background, Chinese, Korean, Indian, Fijian, Swiss, British. Uh, Belgian, no matter who your, what your background is, if you're a New Zealand citizen, our national languages, your national language is <laughs> Māori and English. So you've got Māori as a national language, it's one of Ngātero New Zealand's national languages. Another example, Māori schools, where education from um, our version of K1 to Year 12 is delivered in language. We've also got English schools and we've also got hybrid schools a bilingual national anthem. So if you're a New Zealand citizen, and even if you're not, and you want to sing along with the All Blacks, um, you know, we sing our national anthem in both Māori and English. Māori people, we participate in every aspect of society, whether it be educators, parliamentarians, Hollywood directors, 
um, frontline workers to commerce. We are present in every aspect of society, and not because of any race-based exceptionalism, but definitely we are exceptional, but because the very fabric of New Zealand society reflects that we have chosen to deal with and continue to deal with the historical aspects of colonisation, sovereignty, equal representation, Māori renaissance and Māori uh, self-determination, mana motuhake. Uh, and I can, I will give you first-hand witness that, you know, far from fragmenting our country and fragmenting our society, we have been able to come together. Far from it being a, a, a site of disunity, we've come together and be able to um, mature together so that each individual and organisation and entity, we have developed within us our ability to think about our own responsibility to the other. We think about what it looks like to be in relationship with, uh, with Tangata Tiriti, so or the British who come under the treaty, but also with you know people of other nations, as they choose to uh, and have you know receive that responsibility and do take on that mantle of responsibility and engaging with Māori people. I think, I mean, suffice to say that much of that has come about because of our treaty, our Treaty of Waitangi. But you know that is the Treaty of Waitangi is a colonial document, you know colonial document, but we have chosen to embrace it in a way that's not alienating, but rather edifying. And some of the implications of that is, means um, we haven't lost our respective identities. So Māori can stand in their, uh, mana can continue to stand in their own cultural identities, and non-Māori can continue to stand in their own cultural identities or the stories of their people. But where it benefits both, we can choose to come together and work through things in partnership um, to deal with what, what it is that we want new, what it is that how we want to progress. We work out our relationship with one another in partnership. And so this, I think, is the common good. Finally, the space where we can be free in our own cultures and identities and in our own stories uplifting the other where it benefits us both and working out a relationship in partnership with one another. This is the invitation for connection present to us today. After 65,000 years of continuous culture, our first peoples are asking us, help them be recognised in this 122-year-old Australian constitution and give them that recognition in a practical form, and that form being the voice, so that they may have a say over things that impact their lives. So obviously coming back to where I, when I started, I said uh, I found it strange when I first came here, there was an absence, an absence of everyday encounter or connection with Australia's First Peoples. But that was 20 years ago, and, and things have changed, but have they changed enough? That's the question that we are going to be wrestling with in about six weeks' time. So, just to set the scene, we are going to vote in a referendum uh, on Saturday, the 14th of October. If you are 18 and eligible and enrolled to vote, the vote is compulsory. There will be early voting. Uh, it opens about two weeks, um, at two weeks ahead. There'll be you know, early voting polls and you will be able to do a mail vote. I'd really encourage everyone to check that the enrolment details are up to date this week. I wanted to, um, I'm really happy to answer any questions, but I think it might be relevant to... I wanted to hand out... Um, do you know what the referendum question is? I'm going to be handing out your... Does anyone want to see what the referendum question is? I'm happy to... Right. We're going to be asked, okay, let's go down to the second box here. The second box. We will be asked to vote yes or no, and we need to write it yes, Y E S, or no. Uh, we write yes, Y E S. Um, the question we're going to be asked is a proposed law to alter the Constitution to recognise the First Peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal 
and Torres Strait Islander Voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration? That's it. And then we'll have an like two boxes where we choose to write our response. <coughs> At this point, I'm really happy to go anywhere with any questions or I can continue on with talking about, I'm really happy to go anywhere, what the change will look like, how it's actually going to change the constitution, where this proposal has come from, like the journey to today. Um, I would love to know where your guys' concerns are. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause oh, yeah. to Tehrana. I think the nature of the politics here is well known in Australia and uh, there's clearly a strong support for the no case. But clearly the no case in the referendum is supported by two different types of people. Those who think this process goes too far in uh, acknowledging uh, Indigenous rights and those who think it doesn't go far enough in embracing treaty. Is there a danger that we will have the same situation this time as happened with the referendum on the Republic, where there were similarly two groups opposed to the Republic, the monarchists and those who didn't like the particular model with which the Australian people were presented. There is an asymmetry here that I'm pointing to, that it's difficult to get referendums passed when the opponents are cover different sections of public opinion. Uh, has this problem arisen in New Zealand in terms of attitude to Maori? I presume it has. Some people would like more uh, affirmative action, more rights for Maori people, and others uh, don't want to go so far as has already been gone. If that situation is a parallel, what lessons can we learn from the New Zealand experience that will be helpful to us over the next few weeks before the referendum occurs? Thank you. There's a lot in that. I just want to make a comment. Um, I want to say that us voting in this referendum is not an affirmative action, okay? We, it, both non-Indigenous and Indigenous, are bound by the same rules of how do we change our constitution. The rules are set there in the constitution by our framers, which is we have to go to, to change a constitution, we need to go, to go to referendum, there needs to be a double majority pass, okay? So this isn't, whilst we have been asked by Australia's First Peoples to participate in this, it's been it's their uh, their agenda, it's it's their plan and their program to get it constitutionally enshrined, right? Because historically in Australia, any initiatives or government um, established bodies or um, other bodies that have been established to try and advance Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander interests have been defunded, wound up, pulled, closed down. So the only way to achieve some sort of permanency is by seeking to get it enshrined in our constitution. But the only way to change a constitution is by having all Australians agree to it. So I just made the comment about this voice isn't about affirmative action. This is just our, our opportunity to participate in this together. Um, in terms of you know, a, raft of, you know, a raft of responses or reactions to this, to this both black and white, you know, the truth is Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander peoples are not homogenous. And just like any of us non-Indigenous, we're going to have a diversity of views, a diversity of perspectives, which is the strength of our democracy. It's, it's an incredible strength of our democracy. Um, I do think, like, ultimately, though, we need to remember that anyone who's opposing it on the no side, they've got a much easier job than any of us who are trying to bring this referendum and lift this referendum up. Why? The no side, they just have to convince voters to not vote yes. You know, they just want to, you don't know, vote no. They just say, they just want you to maintain the status quo. That is, um, they don't have to work that hard, but on the, on the yes side, they have got to uh, persuade you to vote yes. So 
And so I'm going to suggest to you or put to you that there is uh, much on the no side is, is misguided, there's definitely misinformation, uh, but their, their arguments do not even have to make any logical or rational sense. It just needs to achieve that outcome of seeding some doubt that you, the voter, don't want to move from the status quo. So our, our challenge is to how do, we, how do we get to yes, how do we get persuaded, and then also talk to our neighbours and friends and families. <coughs> Um, I'm not sure I've quite answered the question. Huh? So the differences of you in New Zealand of this sort. In other words, the Maoris have got representation in Parliament. Is there a lot of strident opposition to that? Uh, and no. on, what, on what grounds? Actually, what I might go back to is, um, of course, so uh, my colleague here did talk about representation in Parliament. I will clarify this voice is going to be a body that sits outside of Parliament, right? Not looking to be in Parliament, it will sit outside of Parliament. The voice's function will be to give independent advice to the government or to Parliament on matters that wholly affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. There is a um, there is a strength and perhaps a weakness to the way it's been presented. The strength in it being sitting outside uh, outside the parliament is because in Australia we're we're part of a parliamentary democracy, so the supreme lawmaking power sits with parliament. Okay, so a voice sitting outside of parliament is able to maintain that. It's, it's got some legal coherence there. Um, in terms of, but because Parliament holds that supreme decision-making power, the voice can't veto decisions. So Parliament can take that advice, can listen to that advice, can ignore that advice. Can, well, the Parliament will have ultimate decision-making over over what the advice put to um, put to them by the voice. However, politically, it will be I think it'll be politically really unwise and will not fare well for our, you know, our, our members, our, our representative members and our senators to ignore you know, well-considered, thoughtful advice from The Voice. So I'll make that comment about sitting outside of Parliament. I do want to say um, maybe what we, might be more relevant in terms of from the New Zealand experience is um, I'm too far to and when the British came and we had to, we have a very, we, I will say we have a very different uh, historical context in the way our, our political relations emerged in Aotearoa, New Zealand, different to, to here. But, you know, as, as peoples, we're not one people, the Māori people. We're lots of different peoples. I'm too far to tour. I'm also Te Arawa from my grandmother's side. Um, the king is, uh, the king and the queen before that, our kingitanga or, or our, our um, royalty comes from the Tainuri tribes. You've got tribes all the way up north, all the way down to the south. We, as our own clans, are our own sovereign peoples. But at the time of uh, British colonisation, the Māori chiefs and the Māori peoples recognised there was going to be some benefit to come together and form a kingitanga. We didn't have a need for kingitanga because we saw that the people that were paramount over us were our sovereign chiefs, right? The chiefs from our own nations. But... They chose the, the chiefs at the time chose to come together and form a kingitanga or form a, uh, a like a royalty in order, which is actually it was a political body in order to negotiate and represent interests of Maori people directly with the British government. Um, I want to make that analogy because I think there is some um, uh, to draw to draw out this like comparison <coughs> that sometimes it's. Indigenous peoples might see that there is some use in, in creating a new political body to be able to advocate for their own interests that, that affect all Indigenous peoples, rather than just, you know, discrete things. There, does that mean that the Kingitanga can make decisions in relation to my peoples and my lands? No, they can't, because our, my, supreme, um, my, my supreme iwi leader is, is my chief. But, you know, in relation... But we still recognise that that relationship with the, the King Tunga. So I just, I make, the comment I'm making is really, they chose, our indigenous peoples over there, chose in a moment of time to form a new sort of political entity, the King Tunga, in order to make relationships with, um, make relationship with the British Crown. Other questions? Yes, um, for quite a 
quite some time there was talk about, oh yes, but we have to have a treaty first. And that, I don't know why people aren't really talking about that much now. Um, maybe because there's over 300 nations and you'd have to have separate treaties with each indigenous nation. Um, also, the Maoris had a, um, a treaty. And so it's sort of a bit different there. Um, yeah. And it sort of seems to me, like, I agree, give, like, if it's going to give them more power, uh, Indigenous people more power, to put through reforms that will make them, um, give them equal rights as citizens in Australia, um, that's a failing on our constitution already, isn't it? Which says everybody's equal, or doesn't it? <laughs> okay, there's a good points. Um, okay, before I go into the treaty question, I will just say, set out that the constitution does not recognise people's and things equally, definitely doesn't. Oh, okay. But that's, sorry, that's it's just because it's not meant to be a, like a human rights document. <laughs> it was that the whole point of the constitution was to set up the institutions of power and how the power is gonna to flow to govern uh, this country. Um, and I'm happy to give an example. Would, do you wanna, okay, so um, an example would be, uh, uh, an example is that our federal government, firstly I'll step back, the constitution sets up at the federal level the powers that, that flow from the executive government, from the courts um, and from, from parliament, okay? And they've all got their own, they've got their, all their own forms of power and it's held there together as sort of as a trinity. Um, the <coughs> executive government has the power to make laws in relation to people based on race, okay? That, surely that's some sort of inbuilt inequality. I'm going to talk to you soon. No? Okay. <laughs> um, and, and, the, and the government has only ever used that power in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So while this, there might be the sense of equality, it certainly isn't being practically that way. So we are not a democracy mm -hmm. <laughs> under our constitution. So we're not a democracy. Oh, no, we, we, we're, sorry. Well, I'm going to draw some of us. I'm going to draw. This is this is my friend Peter, and then also I'm going to give the opportunity to my husband, who's Indigenous. Uh, <coughs> uh, sorry, okay. like, uh, sorry. Uh, obviously, Australia is a, a fantastic democracy, an amazing democracy. But the idea that the Constitution of Australia doesn't enshrine rights of equal treatment. It just doesn't. It's not a. So it's not a document that yeah, does that. To me, I thought, you know, like oh, everybody says, oh, everybody's equal in Australia. Well, no, we're not. It's just democracy, but like we're not. Okay. No, no. Australia, the, the the constitution wasn't intended to do that. It actually distributed powers between the states and various things, right? So if you're a Tasmanian, you actually have four times the vote that you has a, a, have it as a New South Welshman, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have the same number of senators as we have, right? But there are many few, many less Tasmanians than there are New South Welsh and, or Victorians, right? So the, the Constitution of Australia is not a document about equal rights. It is, it's not what it does. It establishes a framework for it's about how state we operate. Rights. Sorry? It's about state it's about rights. rights. Yeah. And so the reason they did that, and actually it's important, why, why do, why do Tas Tasmanians have more uh, influence in the <coughs> constitution than people in New South Wales have? Is because it equalises the rights, right? It's like saying, well, because you're a small state, so you need to have more influence because otherwise you could be trodden on, right? It's a bit like, well, why do they need a voice? Because otherwise you can be trodden on. It's actually the the, the, the constitution is not a it's not it's not a it's not a it's not a human rights thing. It's, it doesn't actually create that system, right? So, thank you. Have I been <laughs> uh, that was awesome. Thank you. I appreciate I that. Read, if, you, if you read the Constitution, which is a fairly boring document, but I recommend everybody try and find a copy and read it. 
you'll find that it's quite clear there are at least still two remaining provisions in it which you'd have to say are race-based. So the point about the refer this referendum isn't about race. There's already race in the Constitution. This is about who was here first. It's not, they could have been pink, green, or Vikings that got here first. You know, it's who was here first and who had the bloody joint, isn't it? And, and have been dispossessed badly through colonisation and other bureaucratic processes and that they need to be heard along with the other 5,000 lobbyists in Canberra. Okay. I just want to yeah. make, uh, make a response to a relation to treaty. Um, it's come up twice now. Uh, so this push for the voice, it comes off the back of work from the Statement from the Heart, yeah? Statement from the Heart, issued in 2017, is what sets out the agenda, the, the political aspirations and agenda for Australia's First Peoples, the signatories. Um, and they, the agenda is voice, treaty and truth. So it must be clear and it needs to be said that treaty is not off the table, but they are going for voice first. And I, I mean, I'm happy to, can I take a moment to tell the story? Yeah, so, um, so this initiative for this referendum change happened, like this has been going on for like 15 years or, or so, um, and had, has had bipartisan support uh, for what does constitutional recognition. Uh, being funded, we have our parliamentary inquiries, with, um, and then in 2013 they established the Referendum Council, appointed Professor Megan Davis um, and Arnie Pat Anderson to head up the Referendum Council. And then they were funded to go around Australia and they ran 12 regional dialogues, 12 regional dialogues. They invited um, First Nations peoples to, to participate in the dialogues. It was 60% um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander organisations, 20% uh, the, the delegates, 20% um, of uh, individuals, and then 20%. Um, sorry, I can get the, get you the details afterwards. So First Nations peoples, there was a structured process and who got invited in, and the question put to them was, what form of constitutional recognition do you want? What form of constitutional recognition do you want? Obviously, I'm calling out here that the question was go out to the peoples and find out what constitutional recognition you want because that work of constitutional recognition that, and that conversation have been going on for many years before that. So what form of constitutional recognition do you want? And they looked through it. Do you want a, like a head of power? Do you want a statement of acknowledgement at the beginning of the constitution? There were all these forms of recognition to be explored, but you know, more than consensus, just wholeheartedly, the, the desire that came out was we want, we want a voice to Parliament and we want agreements or agreement making. So that's a voice to Parliament and treaty. So which is why in the, it culminated in the Uluru Convention, the 13th Regional Dialogue, signed by 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including some who now do oppose it, or are in publicly opposing it, um, is signed by 250 delegates and it's, it's put to the people, an invitation to the people, come along with us, join us in this movement of a walk for a better future. We want voice to parliament, we want a constitutional enshrinement, voice to parliament, we want treaty, we want truth telling. Okay, so I just want to debunk any thoughts that we're not going to get, going to go for treaty, but the political voice, a voice, and the constitution requires a political will. We needed to get. The, we're going for the voice first. We will be going for treaty afterwards. And I'm going to. I'm going to add to that. Why do we want to go for voice first? Because government and parliament has the power to make laws and policies and programs that overwhelmingly affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples for their benefit, but also for their disbenefit and for you know like complete adversity to them too. So we want to get a voice in the constitution just to stabilise that so that, you know, I mean, I know Jeff was here, he would say this, basically it's going to be a professional lobby group, a professional lobby body that can advocate to parliament um, and enter into the government. Because I want you to, oh, sure. So can I, I'd like to add to what Frank said about the no vote people who are different from the Peter Dutton lot, let's say, that's how I see it. Peter Boyle had an excellent article in the Green Left Weekly, this, this issue, 
say they're a progressive nose. Yes. And that's the way I like to think of it. Progressive nose. Think of who uh, people voting progressive nose. I've been to lots of meetings like this, and it's all about yes. It's all about people saying yes, and the no is just sort of vilified as sort of un incomprehensible, not very serious. And I think we have to, before October, I don't want this to fail. I agree with Peter, it's a historic moment. It's really important to make it work. So how can you turn the ship around? How can you reframe the debate so that the non-progressive, you know, the, you know the, the other no's are sidelined and the progressive no's are somehow incorporated in the yes so that it's all the public discourse, people are saying, oh, it's going to be, it's going to, the polls are saying it'll be a no. And people are being very defeatist in my, the people I speak to. A lot of people are very defeated about it. But I think the no's, the progressive no's, have a really big point to make. They have a really big cause. And somehow, I want to know what you think, diplomatically or in the media, how can we turn it around so that's a positive and an energetic thing, not a, just a defeatist you know, thing. Can you speak to that? Sorry. That's all right. Come on up. But I, I, I totally get yeah. that. I, I, I get the concept that um, it's not enough, right? Mm. But I, I just wonder what voting no achieves. Like, does that achieve uh, progression going forward? I, I don't see how it does. I'm not voting no. No, no, no. no I'm, I'm, not not su I'm not suggesting you are. But I'm just saying, knows. like, the progressive no. I just wonder what that achieves. Like. I can understand, I totally understand, I totally get why that's, like, we can say that that's not a sufficient uh, progress. Totally get that. But uh, I just wonder how, like, if, if, if we wake up on October 15, uh, it's a no, like, where have we got to? Does that mean it's more likely we're going to get treaty? Um, I think no, right? Obviously. It's got to be absolutely no. Is it more likely we're going to get more... Progressive. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Is anyone engaging with the progressiveness? Yes, That's yes, 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 yes. If we're all sitting here with yes, no, 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 no I'm definitely, you. yes. I'm no. definitely in close relationship Sorry. with people I would consider progressive no's and yeah. who are actively organising a, a campaign to express their view in the, in the vote. Hmm. And I, I am able to respect that because I'm, I'm going to speak from my position as a person of two cultures and two marginal cultures. So I'm, I'm, I've got experience in sort of navigating like between, you know, in the margins. It's not an incredibly comfortable place, I might add. Mm. But so I'm, I've got this, I'm willing to receive people who are talking about full yes, you know, soft yes, soft no, hard no. I'm, I'm really okay with that. But I just challenge every individual, because it's our one vote, right, to, to think critically about what it is that we're choosing to say yes to, or what it is we're saying to choose to say no to. In relation to the progressive no's, um, uh, so I mean I would characterise it as like it's either a sovereignty, it's, it's, it's ultimately a sovereignty push, but then also the other argument is we do not want to be, they do not want to be part of, you know, being recognised in a colonial document. It's in a comfortable place, of course, I, I recognise that, I just... I'm not sure what what a solidarity vote in line with people who have those views is is helpful because we are not being asked to remove the constitution. You know, if there is incremental promise and incremental change that comes from changing the constitution and this vote, I think it's worth it. And that's you know, ask for our individual courage to to make that, even though we might be in relationship with people who don't have um who don't hold the same views. Um, at a personal level I just I want to encourage all of us just to hold space for those who are still struggling, who are still undecided, who um, I think we've got to remove the politics out of it and actually just like what does it look like to be human and to keep loving on the other person no matter where they're at with that. I like, think it's really, really important. Um, in relation to sovereignty, you know, I think uh, Uncle Michael Mansell from Tasmania, he's definitely, he's going out talking about the seventh state of Australia, you know, how, how, have, you know, he's got a proposal out there. Oh, I'll step back. What is important to recognise is protesting is one thing, but you, protesting can only get you so far. We have to engage with politics at some point. If you want to move, your, move from your protest 
uh, protest movement into some real change that affects the halls of power and affects institutions. We have to engage with politics. Michael, Uncle Michael Mansell has actually putting out a, he's put out an idea there, but he hasn't got a coherent program, with all respect. He hasn't got a coherent program about that, you know, seventh state uh, of Australia um, that can be recognised by the Commonwealth because certainly the Constitution already can establish a seventh state. It can, um, of all the Aboriginal peoples, I guess, you know, can get taxes to be funding that seventh state, etc., etc. What's been pointed out to me, though, that seventh state of Australia, should Michael wish to progress and actually develop a program around it, that can be done under legislative processes, and that can be done even if we have a voice to parliament, because that's going to take some time to develop, particularly time to develop in a program. In the meantime, we do want something that's going to be able to inform government and inform parliament as they continue to make decisions that adversely affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So. Um, I mean, I, I, I won't actually argue against uh, particularly Indigenous peoples, Aboriginal peoples, if they choose to express uh, their progressive no in relation to sovereignty. I've got to respect that. They are, they are our first peoples. They've been here before me. I come under their authority. Um, but, you know, I think, I just, I do think there's capacity to have not either or, but both and. And so... For us, you know, we've got to think about that and think about that opportunity when we go into to poll. Hi, my name's Carl Wadigo. I'm T's husband. I'm a Bunjalung man and a Torres man and South Sea Island descendant. Just in ref um, to your um, question about the progressive, no. Uh, I've been in some conversations with um, Aboriginal elders um, around this um, conversation. Um, and there are many who believe that we have already had the power to, um, since the 1967 referendum, to fix these issues um, and address Aboriginal um, and people the Torres Strait Island uh, in politics, and we haven't. It's been 50 years now, and we have not done that. Um, so... Um, on a practical and, and just uh, on a um, from a personal level, um, I don't think we're going to. Um, with um, I, I just like we haven't yet. So you're saying is this our opportunity? Is that what you're saying? This is our opportunity. Um, as far as the progressive no is concerned, <coughs> um, with the voice, as Peter was saying. Um, a, a yes vote, I can't see how it would affect any, um, I can't, I've yet to see any legal um, argument that would affect the idea of treaty and sovereignty. I, I'm yet to see how it would even uh, um, affect some sort of um, United Nations a legal effort. Um, if that's where our sovereign, my sovereign uncles, brothers and sisters want to go. I can't see how uh, any concession um, to have a voice representing your people in uh, for uh, issues like um, Aboriginal deaths in custody and, and, and these things that really save lives. How that would affect um, any future legal treaty thing, and I'm not a lawyer, but uh, maybe, or, or and I'm not a United Nations lawyer, or how it would affect a sovereignty movement on a grander scale, um, if you if you know what I'm talking about. Um, but this is a an is a, this is a chance to um, address some things that just continually keep slipping through, even with um, the most representation from Aboriginal parliamentarians at the moment. We still can't save lives. Um, and our people, and that's why um, it's got to be. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, my, my name's Trav. I, uh, you know, I'm not an anybody or anything, and I'm not Aboriginal, but I'm just tra trying to. I'm Loud. trying to uh, understand the logic of this situation. I do have several questions, and the thing I'd like that struck me the most is this. Uh, what's written down right at the end, chapter nine, number three. The Parliament shall uh, make all the laws with regard to this voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. 
And I happen to notice that uh, that contrasts with what you said about New Zealand. That uh, there is, I didn't know this, but you informed us, the Maoris themselves decided the, the, who was going to be the composition of their voice and made a royalty. And uh, they, they, in fact, they, without you know, the, the, permission of the, the permission of the colonialists, they got their representatives out there making laws that were so good that they're, they're still you know, applicable today. And this is what I don't understand, is why uh, Aborigines can't uh, make a, a, you know, a grand assembly by themselves, and would it not be superior to having you know, the, 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 the Australian Parliament uh, determining, who, we'll, we'll say, who your representatives are. And uh, so, that's, yeah, I'm asking that question. When, when, when people say, oh, people who vote no, they're, 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 there's nothing, um, it means nothing will happen. No, 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 no. It's, it's something, people who vote no, a lot of them are just simply asking the question, how will it work? And if it's not going to work that the Aborigines choose their own representatives, then how will it work? Now, uh, that's the thing. And... Um, yeah, just, just, just leave it at that. Okay. It's a natural question. How will it work? Okay, great. I just uh, so the proposed, so the proposal was to change the constitution and insert a new chapter nine, section one hundred twenty nine. I'm going to read it out. All right. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, is a recognition bit in the constitution. Subsection one: There shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. That's the name of the voice, of the body. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the Parliament and to the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, which our colleague Joe is pointing to, the Parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. Mm -hmm. I mentioned before, right, we're going to need to, in order for, I think, really effective movements to influence and change our, our institutions, we have to move from protest into politics, okay? Because that's where power is held in our political institutions. Um, so, of course, since we wanted to... <laughs> it, affect or change, transform our constitution, we needed, we needed political will and we needed to be able to demonstrate, I mean I'm saying we but like I'm definitely not, it's not possessive and I'm not really, I'm not Aboriginal, but um, the, the, the makers of this Uluru Dialogue identified that there needs to be some political will and political currency to be able to get this change afoot, which is why section 3 acknowledges the supremacy of Parliament to make laws with respect to the voice, which of course you're suggesting is, is, um, is a, a weakness. So I'm going to try and muddle through an answer and then maybe hopefully somewhere in there you'll get an answer. Of course it's to be said, um, we get to vote now, but you know what, after the referendum, if it gets up, the hard work for Aboriginal people is going to happen after the referendum. That's when the hard work happens because there will be a consultation process where the Uluru Dialogue will go around with mob all over Australia to ask them what form of voice do you want to look like? We, what do you want it to look like? Who do you want it to sit on? Um, who do you want to sit on it? We don't, that, I know that's the process and we also, voters also have design principles and so we can take comfort that there's going to be some design principles and these have been made transparent so it's going to be um, it's going to be uh, members will be made up of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples it will be gender diverse it'll be a work it will uh, work alongside uh, existing organizations like native title bodies prescribed body corporates peak, uh, peak bodies it's going to be track transparent it will be accountable, it won't, it won't be responsible for delivering services, it won't have a veto power. Those design principles have been given to the Australian public so that we can take comfort when, after the referendum, if the voice gets up, there is a robust process about, around which, you know, mob are going to decide who sits on the voice. 
And then once those people, once the composition terms of functions have been determined, it goes back to Parliament but to pass the laws. So we know this, but you know, the, the question is, who, where's the detail? Who gets to make all that up? That's Parliament. So we need to be asking our parliamentarians. It's the Parliament that decides, because that's what's said there in item three. Have you got remaining questions? Hi, thanks very much uh, for the talk. And uh, this is a really important uh, question. I, I want to counterpose to the, uh, what's called the progressive no uh, position among the Aboriginal people. What I think is the correct position, which is the critical yes. The critical yes is recognising the limitations of what the proposal is, and that it is a very, very small step. Uh, but but it's, it's very important. I think we have to step back and look at the, the whole uh, context. Essentially what we're seeing here is, is, is basically an attempt. The no camp in the end is an attempt to renovate Peter Dutton. In the end, if you have a no vote, you've renovated Peter Dutton. You've put Peter Dutton back into the limelight and I think it's a massive blow against all progressive activity in this country and first and foremost Aboriginal people. If, if when the no gets through then there's not going to be any reportage of the progressive no, it'll all be a reportage of Peter Dutton and Jacinta Price one. Hmm. That's what it's going to be and in the overall context of things momentum is everything in politics. That that whole thing will, will result in a resurgence of the right and the racist movement, and that is going to be the result if the no gets up. So that all the arguments about how we need a treaty, how in heaven's name we're going to get a treaty if we can't get the voice to Parliament up, I cannot see. It's absolute fantasy land. And in fact, I think it's a setback. My own opinion, I really feel strongly about this, it'll be a setback to all the other things we're trying to do, land rights, um, uh, you know, deaths death in custody, all these things will be pushed aside because it'll be a win for the races and it's going to increase momentum on this on every front. So that's why I think we should be looking at and reaching out to people who, you know, seri uh, you know sincerely do put forward the progressive no, and I know many of them here, um, that it's a, it's a major tactical error to support the no camp because I think that's going to have serious long-term consequences for the Aboriginal people if the no gets up. It's, that's my position. I like to think that I'm coming from a politically agnostic rather than a religious point of view like Jim seems to. Um, what I understand is that unless today's Aboriginal people really support the vast majority of today's Aboriginal people really support the voice. It's a useless concept. We've yet to see that really, really demonstrated. And what is a voice, as I think is proposed? It simply, from my point of view, is a federally, federal government funded lobby group on behalf of today's Aboriginal people. Okay. As a concept. Okay. Is my assessment valid or not? Do it's up to you to agree okay. or disagree. So first of all, okay. I'm going to Thanks, say Paul. straight up that the voice is supported by over 80% of Aboriginal and First Nations peoples, okay? If there is over 80% support. Polling has shows that and it, it is sustained. Um, in relation to this, and also this isn't a government initiative, it's not a government proposal. This ask for a voice came from First Nations peoples themselves, the authorities and the statement from the heart, yeah? It comes from First Nations peoples themselves and, and their, their, their signatory. So I think that's an important part of the narrative that sometimes is being overlooked or missed in, this, in the politicking of today. That is all stems from this incredibly generous invitation to all Australian peoples to be part of the, you know, participate in this walk toward a better future. In relation to this idea, so it doesn't come from the government, first of all, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, so it doesn't come from the government. Um, in relation to, what was the other thing? It's not a government initiative, it comes from First Nations peoples, over 80% of Aboriginal and First uh, Torres Strait Islander peoples do support it. When you say it's a lobby group, if it functions as a lobby group, it's absolutely necessary. And let me tell you why. 
because you may. I have a question the necessity. Yeah. I'm just saying, isn't that a precedent, an interesting precedent, where the federal government, for the first time, is actually funding for practical purposes at lobby group for one section of our society? Well, it's for First Nations people, firstly. It's not just one section of our society. Mm -hmm. Sure, then I want to call out the distinction yeah. would be that it's, you know, a voice is going to, is a practical step to overcome the historical oppression that our First Nations peoples have experienced uh, in, in the history of this country. Like there is, a, there is a historical narrative that is very distinct to other lobby groups in Australia. Um, I would say it's about time the federal government started to do something for about First Nations people. <laughs> if you look at the history of the last 250 years. I don't disagree so, with that. Okay, hang on, Paul. Hang on. I'll go over to Fabio and Sorry. we'll keep going with the conversation. Okay. Can I just say that at the age of seven, with much respect, I'm just um, responding to that comment. Um, but it would be hard to see 80% of anybody agreeing with anything um, <laughs> if you look at politics. It, it's very hard to get even 20% or 30% or 40% to agree with anything. If you've got 80% of people from agreeing with one particular um, national movement and you want to disagree because of the sake of the 20%, there's something wrong there. Because you're not doing your maths right. Thank you. Okay, Fabio? Yes, uh, more than a question is uh, a statement that uh, that uh, really uh, is very important to me. I came to this country in 1969 as an Italian migrant. I had no idea that there were any Aboriginal people living in this land until 1972 when my brother and myself, we were making a film in Canberra about the Tenth Embassy. And that's where I learned about an uh, history, a real history of this country. And I'm telling you this story because uh, I already told you two things. Once I didn't know nothing about Aboriginal people in this country, that the white people running this country never told me, never put published any paper at the time. Two, I learned it from indigenous people about the real history of this country. Three, we are living in 2023 and nothing is happening. If anything happens, it's getting worse. Eh? We jailing children, 10 years old, in jail with adults, Never happens anywhere else in the world except in this country. But not only that, now we're widening the whole issue, and the issue that annoys me most is that the other day I watched the news, and this news was about Germany, eh, where the Germans are voting the, the uh, uh, racist, uh, uh, not racist, the uh, Nazi party in Germany very closely to do that. And you know what the, the leader woman said of that party? He said, we're learning how do things to do with migrants, because they don't want any more migrants, mm -hmm. to shoot them. If they come to our land, we shoot them. This, we learned it from Australia. Yeah. So how we, our people, white people, are we really wanting to live with knowing that in Europe, that's what people say about Australia? Basically what they're saying, we are a, a national fascist. And it's that, this is the reality. That's the way people see us. We've got to change that. We, we are responsible for what happened to these indigenous people in this country. I came in 1969, but even before that, my ancestors, they came here and they killed people. We're still killing people today. We should be out in the streets every day complaining. How come that so many people die in jail? I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And we're putting back all this issue on the Aboriginal people. No, look at us. We're the responsible. Look, uh, I was born Quick. in New Zealand, but that's by the way. And so is Michael over here. Um, yeah, look, uh, this just goes on like in a sort of a vacuum that, you know, all other colonised countries are, are forgotten. Like they've done nothing, apparently. It's just up to, up to Australia, about to do something really wonderful, perhaps. But that's not true. I mean, I'd like to talk, if you can talk for a minute, about New Zealand's uh, dedicated uh, seats in Parliament for Maori people. I mean, this is since 1830 or 1860-something. Sorry, I've got, forgotten the date. If you could just talk a little bit about that. Because the context in which 
what other people are doing and the strides they have made, and the indigenous people in those countries, other countries like Canada, like New Zealand, like even the US, have made in, in their struggle. And we're, and we're acting as if we're going to maybe do something wonderful. But we're actually way back in the dark ages. Yeah. And we need to leave. You know, sorry. I appreciate your question, because actually it takes me back to Joe's question, which I um, you know, overlooked. Um, so... Yes, in New Zealand, we've got uh, you know dedicated seats in in Parliament for Māori representatives. We already we also have you know uh, Māori. We've got Māori parliamentarians that have come up through the regular party system. We have a Māori party. Um, we have our kingitanga. We have it every. And I guess it goes to that as, you know every aspect of society where because of the strength of the engagement and relationship between Māori and non-Māori that we've chosen to, we've, we've had this, we had to carve out spaces, carve out free spaces for ourselves to participate in democracy. Um, and we've seen that in other colonial countries or Commonwealth countries. Here I don't know why, you know, we hold so tight to being unable to create a little bit of space. It, it is, I do hate to say that this is going to be incremental change because for the progressive nose, it's, it's not what they want. I get that. But, you know, I, I, I think why not look for, for trying to create this free space, free space being where, you know, people can participate in democracy, just create more and more free spaces. Um, I, don't, I don't understand why the incredible reticence around that. Um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, Joe, you asked about why can't they have this and have that and have a voice. I mean, there are local voices. I've got, I've got to make this comment, obviously. It, we're, look, we're going, we are voting for a national voice. The question is being put, us, put to us, non-Indigenous, because we need to change the, the, the request is to change the constitution. But there are national voices on foot. And it's going to be up to local mob or mobs to figure out what that looks like. In, uh, you know, we've got, they're, they're going for treaty in Victoria. So we've got, the, they have a national congress there, First Nations Congress in Victoria. In South Australia, they have passed legislation to form a South Australian voice. So that's, uh, that, that is their local voice. In uh, the township, the remote township of Burke, which is about 12 hours or nine hours from, uh, you know, northwest of Sydney, up near the, the border of Queensland, they've got the Burke Tribal Council. It's, you know, it's, it's comprised of uh, peoples from the 26 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups that have called Burke home. They are also considered a valid voice. I know the national voice will engage with any local voice if they form together and to represent, and so that also includes like, you know, peak body organisations, native title bodies, prescribed body corporates. Um, so I guess what I haven't, you talk about who gets the supremacy, the national voice is going to be advocating on matters overwhelmingly affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that executive government or the parliament is going to make decisions on. In relation to, I think, local issues, you know, they, they're going to be taking advice from local voices. So they will be, I've got to, I think of it as like, it's going to be, uh, so a national voice will be like putting up information from the local voices, advice from the local voices, and then being able to advocate at a national level. Particularly because there are many powers that are reserved only for the, na the federal government. And, and for national parliament. But we, we are in a federated system, so there will be local voices too that will have the power to make, you know, um, to make, provide advice at the state level. Yeah. Um. Okay.